This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya. And I'm Talia. And we are TNT Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hey, Talia. Hi, Tanya. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I am great, too. Welcome back, listeners. Are you ready for a story today? I am. But before we start, Talia, really quick, I would just like to tell our listeners, if you tune in at the end of this episode, you can hear a promo from our friends at Murderish and a special shout out to Jamie there. I just need to remind everyone to either hit subscribe or follow on whatever podcast app you are using. Thank you. Thanks. So now are you really ready? I'm so really ready. Okay. Today I'm going to tell you a horrible story. Great. About James DiVaggio and Michelle Michaud. Have you ever heard of them? I have heard of them, but I don't know all the details. Oh, just you wait. These winners met in 1996, and within a few months of the start of their relationship, James moved in to Michelle's home in Sacramento, California. They lived together until about August of 1997, when Michelle was evicted from that house. They had nowhere to go, so basically they started living in Michelle's green Dodge minivan. The minivan had a sliding passenger side door, you know, like how minivans do, and it had a childproof lock on it. And the back seats and middle seats in the back of the minivan were removable. And at some point, James and Michelle had removed the middle seats of the van. Was that so they could maybe put a mattress and sleep on it? Possibly. James and Michelle had friends that were named Janet and Ted. Janet and Ted allowed James and Michelle to stay with them for a few nights in September of 1997. So this is right after they got evicted. After their stay had ended with Janet and Ted, Janet and Ted left town for a few days to go on a vacation. When they came back, they discovered that their house had been broken into and that their shower was used. That's a little weird. Right. And later, Michelle confessed to Janet that her and James had broken into the house and stayed there while they were gone. Why didn't she just ask if they could? I know. That's just creepy. Around this same time, Michelle had a 12-year-old daughter, and she was about three months shy of her 13th birthday, and we'll call her Rachel. Rachel had a friend that we'll call Christina, who was 13 at the time. Christina had known Michelle since she was about four years old, so she really did trust Michelle. And oftentimes, she would spend time with Michelle when Rachel wasn't around, So she's like a second mom. Right. And by September of 1997, Christina had known James for about nine months. One night in September, Michelle knocked on Christina's door and invited her to run errands with her. Rachel wasn't with them. Christina said sure, and they left together in Michelle's green minivan. And they ended up at Ted and Janet's home. They figured that out later. And this was while Ted and Janet were on their vacation. So this is when they broke into the house. When Christina and Michelle went inside, James was sitting on the couch watching a TV show about mobsters. At some point, he told Christina that he collected baseball cards of serial killers. I've heard of them. Right, me too. And sometime that night, James and Michelle used methamphetamine in the kitchen and urged Christina to join them. Even though she told them she didn't want to, they forced her to snort it. She's 13. She's 13, yes. After they had her snort the meth, Michelle took Christina to the bathroom to talk to her, and she locked the door behind her. Michelle told Christina that she wanted to party with Christina. She's like, what, seventh grade? Exactly, right? And I believe at this point, Michelle and James are in their 30s, maybe late 30s, early 40s. This is getting really sick. Yeah. Already. Yes, I'm sorry. It's going to get worse. Christina said she didn't want to party with Michelle. So Michelle took a handgun out of her pants and she put it on the counter. And I think she did this to just intimidate Christina. What the hell? She told Christina, don't worry, it's just for protection. But then told Christina to take off her clothes. 
When Christina refused, Michelle took her clothes off, removed her bra, and licked Christina's chest. And when Christina refused to take off the rest of her clothes, because I think what happened was she just took off her top and her bra, Michelle undressed her forcibly, opened the door, and guided her out. She told James that Christina was his present. Oh, jeez. I fucking hate her. I know. She's disgusting. I don't know which one of them is more disgusting. James didn't seem surprised at this. He walked toward Christina, moved her toward the bedroom, and began to kiss her. As he's kissing Christina, Michelle takes off James's pants and is performing analingus on him. Oh, my God. Jesus. Hold on. Okay. Continue. James then used his fingers and his mouth on Christina while Michelle masturbated. What? When James stopped, Michelle gave him a blowjob and told Christina to do the same. When Christina refused, she attempted to force Christina to do so. James then raped Christina for roughly 15 minutes while Michelle went back to performing analingus on him. Eventually, Michelle returned to the bathroom with Christina and told her to take a shower. While they were getting dressed, Michelle told her if she told anyone, she would kill her. I feel so bad for that girl. Oh, me too. I feel terrible for Christina. Her world was just turned upside down. And this is from someone she trusted. A few weeks after the Christina incident, a woman we'll call Alita was a 20-year-old student attending night school in Reno, Nevada. On the night of September 29th, around 10 p.m., Alita began walking home after class. Roughly about 10 minutes later, Michelle's van pulled up beside her. James opened the sliding door and grabbed her, pulling her inside and then shutting the sliding door. Alita is a stranger to them. So now they're just taking people off the street. Right. As Michelle drove, James groped Alita in the back of the minivan. He told her to get undressed. Being afraid, she took off part of her clothing and James removed her bra. James raped her then in the back of the van. At some point during the rape, Alita tugged on Michelle's hair for help and Michelle ignored her. After raping Alita, James asked her if she was sexually interested in women because he wanted Michelle to come in the back of the van. I'm sure Alita was in shock at this point because she didn't respond. What does it matter what her answer is yes or no? Right? And Michelle didn't go in the back of the van. What happened next was Michelle put a cassette tape of the Johnny Cash song, I Shot a Man in Reno, into the radio. And as the song is playing, James tells Alita that the song was about a man who killed another man in Reno just to watch him die, but told her he's never killed anyone. He also told Alita that he couldn't return her to Reno because he had kidnapped her and was worried about going to jail. James then asks Michelle, so what do you think? Should we go ahead and go with the plan? Michelle tells him that she needs 10 minutes to think about it. After a few minutes, he asks her again what she wanted to do, and he said he'd leave the decision up to her. Michelle pulled the van off the freeway, because they had been driving around while this was all happening, and told Alita to get out of the van. I can't imagine the terror. Oh my god, I know. James also got out of the van and got into the driver's seat. While this was happening, Michelle told Alita to count to 20 and to not look back. Oh my god. She complied. And she was eventually able to contact police, who took her to the hospital, and a nurse collected samples from her face and neck. Wait, they left when she turned around and got to 20? Yes. I was waiting for you to tell me they shot her in the head. Nope, Alita made it. Oh, well, that's good. Extremely scarred, I'm sure. So I think what you're telling me is that Michelle... Let her go. Let her go. Yeah, that's what James was referring to. Like, what do you want to do? Remember I told you about Michelle's daughter, Rachel? Yeah, Christina's best friend. Christina's best friend, yes. Rachel had a boyfriend, and after Michelle was evicted from her house in Sacramento, she asked Rachel's boyfriend's mom if Rachel could stay at their home, and his mother agreed. So Rachel is staying with the boyfriend's mom. And she's 13. Yes. 
A few weeks after the rape of Alita, Michelle showed up at the boyfriend's mom's house and she wanted to see Rachel. Michelle told Rachel that she wanted them to spend time together before she and James left to go to Oregon because they were looking for a new place to live in Oregon. Michelle convinces Rachel to go out with her and James, and they went to one of Michelle's friends' house. After spending a few hours at that house, and while they're there, people are doing meth, Michelle invited Rachel to join her and James on the road trip to Oregon, and she said she would go with them. During the drive, she fell asleep on the back bench seat, and when she woke up, James was massaging her inner thigh, and he was moving up her pants like he was going to try and go inside of her pants with his hand. Rachel moved his hand away and moved up to the front passenger seat to sit next to Michelle. And Rachel is Michelle's daughter. So she went to the front so she'd be by her mom. Yes, to get away from James. Probably thinking her mom is going to comfort her and protect her. Yes, exactly. And when she moves up there, James is still touching Rachel, like trying to give her a shoulder massage. And Rachel's trying to like move his hand away. She keeps pushing his hand away. And Michelle's not doing anything at this point. They made a bathroom stop and Michelle and Rachel went into the bathroom. Rachel told Michelle what had happened with James in the back seat. And Michelle said, don't worry, I'm going to talk to James and he'll stop. When they went back to the van, Michelle did talk to James. Rachel couldn't hear that conversation. So she's not sure what was said. The road trip resumes. And as before, Michelle is driving. Rachel is in the passenger seat and James is in the back. As they're in the front, out of nowhere, Michelle starts telling Rachel that she's had sex with pretty much everybody Rachel knows. She also told Rachel that Rachel was her, quote, secret lust. This is too much. I know. It's her daughter, Talia. I really just hope she's just so high on drugs right now that that she's just spewing shit out of her mouth because this is awful. It's terrible. She told Rachel that Rachel was her fantasy and that she was going to be an adventure for them. And what Michelle is describing as adventures is she told her, like, for example, what they did to Christina was an adventure for her and James. And what her and James did to Alita was an adventure. Rachel doesn't know it at this time, but that's how Michelle describes what they're doing. I'm surprised Christina didn't tell Rachel what her mom did. I know, right? I know. I, it's probably because Michelle threatened her. Michelle also tells Rachel that I guess Rachel used to smoke marijuana and pass out. Michelle told Rachel that when Rachel would get high and pass out, she would orally copulate her, and she liked it best when Rachel was on her period because she liked the taste of blood. You just stop. Just stop. Stop for one second. Just give me one second. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. Wow. That... I I don't have any words to say, and it's podcast. <laughs> you need words. And I, I need words. I just There's no words to describe no. what I'm feeling right now. I know. I, I can't imagine what Rachel's going through at this point. This is stunning. When Michelle said that to her, Rachel had a drink in her hand and she dropped it because she was shocked. Michelle said to her, see, you're getting wet just thinking about it. Wow. 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 Well, she's clearly not mom of the fucking year. <sighs> Michelle said then that they were going to pull over so they could have a talk. But Rachel said, I don't want you to pull over. But she did anyway. Rachel reached for her tennis shoes so she could try to run away when the door opened, but Michelle locked the doors on her, and Rachel then tried to kick out the windows. At that point, Michelle jumped on top of her, and James made her seat recline. Michelle told Rachel that she could just go along with it willingly, or they were going to take it from her. Michelle straddled Rachel and unbuttoned her pants. James restrained Rachel at that point, and Michelle used her hand on Rachel. And more than once while this is going on, Rachel says, quote, mommy, stop. Did she like digitally penetrate her? Yes. And she's crying out to her mom to stop. Yes. 
after that, James drags Rachel into the back of the van because this is happening in the front seat. James and Michelle pull Rachel's pants down and James performs oral sex on her. Rachel was screaming, crying, and trying to fight him off while this is happening. And while this is happening, Michelle is again performing analingus on James and she's masturbating. When this horrible incident is over, Rachel cries herself to sleep in the van. When she wakes up, they're outside of a motel. They got a room and they went inside and Rachel fell asleep in one of the two beds that was in there. When she woke up the next morning, she found Michelle was next to her on the bed, naked. Michelle asked if James could have sex with Rachel and Rachel said no. They then duct taped Rachel's mouth from ear to ear, took off her pants, and duct taped her hands behind her back. James performed oral sex on Rachel while Michelle is masturbating and wiping away Rachel's tears. Eventually, Michelle told James that he could stop now, and he did. Michelle then had sex with James on the other bed. About a half an hour later, after they had sex, Rachel shook her head to them to indicate that she wouldn't scream, so they took the duct tape off her mouth and her hands. They kept her duct taped while they had sex next to her? Yes. They all eventually drove to Christina's house. Christina saw the red marks and the black lines around Rachel's cheeks, mouth, and wrists, and she noticed that Rachel looked really scared. They asked Christina if she wanted to go with them to Santa Cruz, and she agreed. What? Yeah, she agreed, and she said the reason she did was that she said, quote, I felt if they did anything to her like they did to me, I don't think I would want to be alone either. So she did it for Rachel. On their way back from Santa Cruz, James drove into a wooded area. He pointed a gun out a window and he shot it, I'm sure, to intimidate the girls. Rachel and Christina were holding each other because they were afraid that James and Michelle were going to kill them. Christina said she did understand that what James did was done to intimidate them and to keep them quiet. After they're in the wooded area and this happens, they get back on the freeway. And according to Rachel, at some time between her first assault in the van and the return from Santa Cruz, Michelle said that if they ever told anybody, they would kill them both. Did so, they actually assault Christina and Rachel? No. Once they picked up Christina, they did not assault either of them. That's odd. I would have expected them to have a free-for-all. Right. A few weeks after the assault on Rachel, and this is sometime around November 1st through November 4th in 1997, a woman we'll call Amy was at the home of a friend, and this friend was also friends with Michelle. At the time, Amy was a meth addict and used at least every other day. While at the friend's house, Michelle came over. She was saying she was upset with James and she wanted to go for a drive. Amy and Michelle got into Michelle's van and they went to a motel room that Michelle said she got because she needed to receive a phone call. And this was before cell phones. Is this some ruse that she's developing? Yes, this is some ruse. While they're in the hotel room, they talked for about 15 to 20 minutes. During that time, Michelle was complaining about James. She was crying and she put her head in Amy's lap. Amy was then hit on the back of the head with what she believed was a gun. She was in a daze, and as she came out of it, James handcuffed one of her wrists and punched her in the face, which caused her to bleed from her mouth. Michelle and James told her to shut up or else she would die. After she was punched, someone cuffed her other wrist. She's not sure if it was James or Michelle. And one of them put a gun against her head. Amy heard it click and then heard James say, damn it, it jammed. I don't even know if it was loaded. I'm thinking this again was a mental tactic to scare Amy. Amy was handcuffed behind her back and Michelle blindfolded her. Amy was resisting the whole time, fighting against what they were doing. One of them put duct tape on her mouth, although it didn't stick really well because of the blood on her mouth. So now she ends up face down on the bed. Michelle cut off her shirt and bra, pulled off her shoes, pants, and underwear. So now she's nude. Michelle performed oral sex on Amy. Then James raped her with Michelle's help. 
I'm not sure what that means, but I'm sure you could use your imagination, right? I'm good. Yeah. Eventually, someone removed the handcuffs and the blindfold, and Michelle removed the duct tape. Both James and Michelle told her that if she ever told anyone, she would die. Amy said she was in the hotel room for at least six or seven hours. During part of that time, Michelle was washing bloody sheets, so she was in and out of the hotel room. While Michelle was out of the room doing laundry, James told Amy that this was all Michelle's idea. Before taking Amy back to their friend's house, Michelle told her she had already told a mutual friend that Amy had gotten drunk at a bar, fallen, and injured herself to explain away the injury she had in her mouth. They dropped her off and again told her not to tell anyone or she would die. Apparently, Amy stayed at this house for several days because about four days later, Michelle and James showed up and Amy was still there. As Michelle was leaving, she said to Amy, I see you didn't tell. And Amy said, I'm still alive. And she ended up not telling the police about what happened for about three years. Oh, I don't blame her. I mean... I can't blame her either. She's probably just so traumatized. Now I'm going to tell you about another girl we'll call Sharona. I'm not sure how old she was, but she knew James through her two best friends, which were James's daughters, April and Janie. They were teenagers, so I believe Sharona was a teenager. So James has teenage daughters? Yes, he does. And Michelle has Rachel. Yes. April had spent some time living in the house in Sacramento with James and Michelle. So while visiting April, Sharona met Michelle. During one of her visits, Sharona had used meth that was given to her by James. Apparently, they're giving it to everyone. Young girls. Right. On November 3rd, 1997, so this is around the same time as the attack on Amy, Sharona was working the night shift at q which was a laser tag arena in Dublin, California. So like I said, I'm not sure how old she is. She could be 17. She could be 18. I don't know. While Sharona was taking a cigarette break, James and Michelle pulled up in the van. They parked it and they walked over to talk to her. James offered her some meth and she accepted. Sharona said, we can go into the q bathroom and do the meth, but James and Michelle didn't want to do that. So they went into the van. Michelle got into the back seat. Now they're still in the parking lot. The middle seats in the back were not in the van. Michelle was chopping up the meth on a mirror and knocked the mirror over, assumingly spilling the drugs. Michelle asked her to come back and help her to pick it up. Sharona went over there, but she didn't see anything. So this was all a ruse. A ruse. As she started to turn around, Michelle tried to push her down. By that time, the sliding door in the van was closed. Sharona fought off Michelle, but James came back there because he was in the driver's seat, and he hit her, which knocked her out. When she regained consciousness, she was dazed, but she was able to orient herself, and she realized that James and Michelle were restraining her. James put handcuffs on her behind her back. One of them bound her legs while she cried, and she struggled to get free. So were her wrists bound and her ankles were bound? Yes. James remained in the back seat with her while Michelle drove the van, and she drove it to the bowling alley that was across the street from the Qzar. When she gets over to the bowling alley, James is yelling at her, telling her, this is a stupid place to be, so Michelle gets on the freeway. While on the freeway, now Sharona is bound, her arms and her legs, So she complained that the cuffs were causing her pain, so James took them off of her. James then told her to give him a blowjob, and she did, while she was crying the whole time. It lasted about two and a half minutes. And Michelle is still driving on the freeway. James told her to exit the freeway, which she did, and she pulled into a residential area and parked next to a field. James didn't like that spot either. So they drove and parked in front of a bunch of big houses. I'm thinking they were still in this neighborhood. Michelle moved to the back seat to join them, and James told Sharona the sliding door was locked and she couldn't get out. He then told Sharona Michelle was going to have her turn. Michelle took off Sharona's pants, performed oral sex on her for about 20 minutes while James watched masturbating. After that was over, Sharona is still naked from the waist down. James took pictures of her and told her that if she ever told anybody, he was going to show everyone the photos. 
They started to drive again, and they headed back to the Qzar. As they're heading back, James and Michelle are talking about how they can't let Sharona go because she knew who they were. And at some point during this drive, they both threatened to kill her. She was really, really scared, as you can imagine. Yeah. And she told them, if you let me go, I will make up a fake story to the police, and I won't say anything about you guys. They ended up letting her go, and they dropped her off at a gas station that was about a block away from the Qzar. Sharona called one of her co-workers to come get her, and when they got back to the Qzar, the police were there. Sharona did end up telling them a fake story. She did. She did, and she said it was something about three guys because she was still scared. And I can tell you, the police really didn't believe her. They thought something had happened, but they didn't believe her story. So after this happens... Around the same time, Michelle had an older sister, Misty. Misty and her boyfriend, Rick, were moving into a new house around November 1st. This is all around the same time. This is all around the same time. James and Michelle stayed with them for a few days. Sometimes Rick did drugs with them during their visit. One night, Rick and Misty were in the front room with James and Michelle. Michelle was reading a book called The Sex Slave Murders, Sounds like something I would read. (laughs) For the podcast, not for fun. Wow. The movie The Silence of the Lambs was on television. When the movie came on, James said that he had read every book about every serial killer imaginable. Me too. (laughs) And he said, you know, out of all the serial killers that I've read about, the one that was his favorite was Gerald and Charlene Galagos. He then said that if he was ever going to be a serial killer, he would be just like the Galagos. Side note, Gerald and Charlene Galagos were serial killers that kidnapped teenage girls that they kept as sex slaves, and then they killed them. During this conversation, Michelle was there, and she had the serial killer trading cards. The top card had the Galagos on it. And she added to the conversation that if they were ever going to do anything like that, that they would want to have a card like the Galagos. James and Michelle stayed the night. The next morning, they had an argument where Rick saw James point a gun at Michelle's head and threatened to shoot her. James left and didn't return until the following morning, and Michelle seemed really happy to see him. They both left together, and they left some of their belongings behind, like a crossbow and the sex slave murder book. As I told you before, James had a daughter named April. For some time, I'm not sure how long, she did live with... James and Michelle at Michelle's house in Sacramento. But by February 1997, and this is probably about nine months before they're evicted and going on this crime spree, she had moved in with her mom, Annette, and her stepdad, Chris Carpenter, in Dublin, California. She had a sister named Jamie. I believe this must be one of Annette's children because Jamie was not James's child. Jamie lived with them. Thanksgiving that year was on November 27th. James and Michelle were in town for the holiday, and they spent several nights in a hotel in the area. How are they paying for this hotel? I have no idea. I would love to know. Twice before Thanksgiving, April and Jamie stayed with one or both James and Michelle at this hotel, which was called the Candlewood Inn. Also around this time, April, who is 16 years old, She was a daily meth user, and James supplied the meth to her. James and Michelle joined the Carpenter family for Thanksgiving, and April went back to the Candlewood Inn with James and Michelle that night because they had promised to take her to the DMV so she could get her driver's license that Friday after Thanksgiving. When they went back, it was just the three of them in the hotel room. April and James... They had a conversation that lasted a couple hours. During this conversation, they talked a lot about things like what would be the perfect way to rob an armored truck. James asked April if she wanted to go on a hunting trip with them, and he was not referring to animals. James described it to her as it's where you stalk someone to kill. April and James also talked about the fear that is in people's eyes. And according to James, he said, when you see that fear, it's like an adrenaline rush. That's the thrill. James told April that when he looks at her, 
she reminds him of himself and that she shows no remorse. James said that you can't have any feelings for anyone. If I was Michelle, I'd be like, excuse me? I know, right? He just said you can't care and you can't have feelings about people. At the end of their conversation, James took a shower, which lasted about 20 minutes. While he was showering, Michelle sat next to April and told her that James was going to have oral sex with April when he finished the shower. Oh, God. And Michelle said to her, I thought you would just feel better if you knew it was going to happen. No, she's getting a kick out of telling her. Right? She's a sick bitch. April was really scared and she didn't know what to do. After James finished his shower, he sat on the bed and told April to sit next to him, which she did. He told her that he really loved her and then started to touch her on the outside of her clothes. April was pushing back and saying no, but James told her, don't worry, that she would enjoy herself. Michelle left and went into the bathroom and closed the door. James took off April's pants and underwear. He kneeled on the floor and performed oral sex on April for about an hour while she cried. About 15 or 20 minutes before he stopped, Michelle came out of the bathroom, laid on the floor, and gave James a blowjob. James and Michelle checked out of the Candlewood Inn on November 28th, so this was the Friday after Thanksgiving, and they took April back to the carpenter's house. Michelle cornered April in the laundry room of the house, and she tried to talk her into coming with them to go on a hunt. Michelle said the day after Thanksgiving would be the perfect day to find someone to kill because everyone's out shopping. When April said she didn't want to go, Michelle became really angry and said that they would have to do it soon. Later that same day, April was with her boyfriend. As they're making out and things, April becomes really upset and she starts crying. Yeah, I'm sure she has post-traumatic stress going on. Right. As she's crying, she told her boyfriend what Michelle and James had done to her. On November 30th, Michelle and James checked into a Motel 6 in Pleasanton, California. At about 6.51 that day, they purchased two curling irons from a Kmart. The next day, December 1st, Michelle and James shopped at an adult entertainment store in Livermore, and it was called Not Too Naughty. They purchased a tape called Submissive Young Girls and a Ball Gag. On that same day, Alita had identified James to an FBI agent, choosing his picture in a photo lineup. On December 2nd, a federal warrant was issued for James's arrest in connection with Alita's assault. That same day, James and Michelle checked out of the Motel 6 they were staying at. And so far, they haven't killed anybody. No, they haven't killed anyone yet. But I have to tell you about a girl named Vanessa. But before I tell you about Vanessa, we're going to take a quick break. Hey, everyone. If you go to our website, TNTCrimes.com, you can find full unreleased episodes available for individual purchase. You can also join our membership where you get unlimited access to all of our unreleased episodes and early releases, mini episodes, and so many other awesome things. So go to TNTCrimes.com. And thanks again for all your support. Vanessa lived with her parents and her siblings in Pleasanton, California. Vanessa was 22. She worked at an insurance company about a mile from the home, and she usually walked to work. She was really dependable, and she never did, like, a no-call, no-show. But on the morning of December 2nd, she was due into work at about 8 a.m., and she would usually get to work about 10 minutes early, but that day, she never showed to work. She left her house sometime between 7.20 and 7.45 a.m., according to her mom. That morning, there were two men working on a roof that overlooked a street on Vanessa's route to her office. Both of them heard a woman scream and then the sound of a van door sliding shut. One of the guys said it was about 7.30 a.m. when this happened, and they both saw a green minivan driving away slowly. So as you've probably guessed, James and Michelle have kidnapped Vanessa. 
The next morning, which was December 3rd, a passing driver found Vanessa's body laying in the snow on the side of the road. A deputy sheriff arrived and after inspecting her body, found no signs of life. She seemed to be frozen and had what appeared to be ligature type marks around her neck. In the area near her body, the deputy recovered a black rope that had human hair on it. That same day, FBI agents visited Misty, who was Michelle's sister, if you remember, her and Rick's home. They're looking for James. And Rick tells the agents that Michelle was supposed to appear in court in Lake Tahoe that same day for an arrest she had where she was accused of passing bad checks. So maybe this is how they paid for stuff. So the FBI went to Lake Tahoe and they end up finding James and Michelle at Lakeside Inn and Casino. FBI agents arrested James on the casino floor at around 6.35 p.m., and Michelle was arrested in one of the guest rooms. In the room, they found a cash box containing both a small pistol and baggies with white powder. They also found a 36-inch piece of yellow nylon rope that was in Michelle's pocket. In her pocket? In her pocket. She had a three-foot-long rope. The green van was also seized. An autopsy was performed on Vanessa by Dr. Rollins, and he determined that her cause of death was asphyxia, that she had been strangled with a nylon rope. He said that she had some of the worst neck injuries he'd ever seen. He noticed there was deep bruising on her rear end and noted there were no physical indications that her arms and legs had been restrained, but he said it's possible to be restrained and not have any Mark's left. His report didn't include any description of trauma to Vanessa's vaginal or rectal areas. However, it was, and this is just a weird side note, it was later discovered that Dr. Rollins had a substance abuse problem with Demerol, which affected his ability, apparently, to give attention to details. He insists, though, I know it's so bizarre. so bizarre. <laughs> he insists, though, that He was absolutely 100% sure that he wasn't loaded on Demerol when he did the autopsy. And he said he didn't do, he said he didn't do a rectal exam on Vanessa specifically because as he understood it, injuries only occur at about 50 to 56% of rectal rapes. And he said if he had known what he knows now, he would have performed one, but that he didn't notice any trauma to the area and therefore he felt he didn't need to, quote, mutilate Vanessa's remains. A.K.A. he did a shit job. He did a shit job, yes. As I mentioned, the van was searched. Authorities found a tape that was called Submissive Young Girls. They took that from the van. That's the one that they bought at the novelty, adult novelty shop, right? Yes. There was a crossbow in the back. And among other things, agents found a white towel On the right front passenger floorboard, wrapped inside the towel was a Revlon curling iron with duct tape on it, one leather braided black belt, a bunch of white tissue with red stains on it, one yellow nylon type rope, a green ball gag, and one roll of duct tape. A second curling iron was recovered in the van, not in the same area as the first. They noted both curling irons were modified. The electrical cords were cut off. The clasp, the metal clasp that's used to hold your hair, that was removed. And there was duct tape around the middle portion where the clasp area was connected. So they made it into a large dildo. Yes, unfortunately. Both curling irons were tested for biological material. And there was brown material in the grooves of the tip of one of the curling irons. On the interior of the tip of the curling iron was what appeared to be fecal matter. Packed inside the curling iron, about three-fourths of an inch deep into the tip was a pellet of brown material, and it was tested positive for Vanessa's DNA. So, yes, they ended up raping poor Vanessa with these curling irons. They modified them to use them as sex toys. James went on trial. He testified in his own defense, and he admitted that he and Michelle had abducted Vanessa and that the number one motive for the abduction was sexual gratification. 
He said both he and Michelle sexually assaulted her. He claimed he wanted to let Vanessa live, but Michelle had told him he had to kill her because she could identify them. He said they had a really heated argument about it and they were going to let her go, but he went to the bathroom and when he came back, he found that Michelle had strangled Vanessa. Okay. Okay. Sure. He said they dumped Vanessa in a snowbank, went back to the motel they were staying at, and then eventually went to the Lakeside Inn where they were arrested. Regarding the curling irons, James said he never touched them aside from when they bought them, but that it was his idea to buy them as sex toys. Though he said Michelle modified them and she was the one to use the curling irons on Vanessa. He said that he and Michelle were equal partners. I believe that. Michelle, during her trial, used the defense that she was a battered woman and that she was completely under James's control. But he denied Michelle was under his control, and he said she was very capable of standing up to him. He said, quote, Neither one of us, I don't believe, was any control factor. James admitted he found violence and aggression sexually gratifying, but that Michelle actually found it more so than he. The information that I got for this episode was from the court records, and I know for sure that April and Rachel testified, and they never said that Michelle was under any type of control of James and that she was a willing participant in all of this. There were bolts inside of the van, like on the floor in the back. Eye bolts? Yeah, eye bolts. And James admitted that he thought about modifying them and making them into some type of restraint in the back. And James said he considered doing that, but I guess they tested it out and he said that he didn't think it would work. He confirmed that he and Michelle assaulted Christina, Alita, Rachel, Amy, Sharona, April, and Vanessa. Regarding Alita, he said the original plan was to sell her as a sex slave, but they abandoned the plan when Alita told them that she had a child at home. James and Michelle were charged for crimes against April and Sharona, in addition to what they did to Vanessa, but all the crimes they committed against all the other girls went uncharged. That sucks. I know. During the penalty phase, witnesses testified that Vanessa was a beloved daughter, sister, significant other, and friend. To her mother, for example, she said Vanessa was sunshine. She was always positive, always happy, caring. Her father said that she was his fishing buddy, a great, great, bubbly person whose grave he now visits after every workday. Vanessa was buried wearing a ring her significant other had bought for her before the last time he saw her. And she used to tell her mom that out of all your children, I'll be the first one to give you a grandchild. James and Michelle were both convicted of first degree murder in Vanessa's case, and they were both sentenced to death. During the sentencing, Judge Larry Goodman called the murder, quote, vile, cruel, senseless, depraved, brutal, evil, and vicious. That about sums it up. Right? That was quite succinct. Tell me, are they hanging out with all the other evil beings in San Quentin? Yes. Yes. James is at San Quentin. Yes. He's there right now. And that is my awful story. Of that, these two horrible people. That just solidifies everything I ever thought about bands. I mean, everything I thought about. Right? Yep. Awful. I, I'm sorry, all you van owners out there. That's I, just horrible. Horrible. It's just shocking. Shocking. I shocking. know. Their own children. The betrayal. It's, yeah, it's quite disgusting. Their own children. That was really messed up, Tanya. Yeah, that was. Wow. Well, thank you, listeners. For listening. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. If you'd like to become a member and enjoy all of our member benefits, which include live episodes, bonus episodes, episodes just like this that are only released online. Yes. Please visit patreon.com slash TNT crimes. You can also visit our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at TNT crimes or TNT crimes podcast. And if you feel so inclined, you can go to our website, TNT Crimes, and just donate 
to us to help support us, show your support if you don't want to become a member, because we do work really, really hard to make these happen and we don't get paid. Before we go to Leah, I have some shout outs. Oh, I love shout outs. We are giving the shout outs to TJF, Caitlin, Jasmine H, Trisha S, Jancy F, Chelsea M, Sue F, Nina C, Nadine R, Elizabeth G, Rochelle S, Stacy M, Amy T, and Rose B. Thank you guys so much for your support. Yes, thank you so much. And we hope you're enjoying our members only episodes. Thank you, Tanya. You're welcome, Talia. And I just want to remind everyone to stick around because in a minute or so, we're going to be playing the promo for our friends at Murderish. Shout out to Jamie because it's a really great podcast and we love to support other podcasts. I actually listened to Jamie and she's great. So check it out. She's going to be the host of Scene of the Crime. Really? Second season. Nice. Yeah. And until next episode. Bye. Bye. Hi, I'm Jamie, host of Murderish, a true crime podcast that provides a 3D look at gripping murder cases from beginning to end. You'll get to know the victims and perpetrators, how their worlds collided, and what went down during trial. I also share some of my own personal experiences, like the time a stranger came into my bedroom at night. Yeah, that really happened, and I walk you through all the details of that terrifying night. Have you ever wanted to be a fly on the wall during a murder trial? You'll get that opportunity on Murderish, as I share my experience being a jury foreman on a first-degree murder trial. Search Murderish in your favorite podcatcher app, hit subscribe, and start binging. And remember, listening to this podcast doesn't make you a murderer, it just means you're murder-ish.